Hey everybody, how you doing? Happy Black Friday to you, and happy Thanksgiving to you, or happy day after Thanksgiving. It's November 24th, 2017, and I woke up this morning not even thinking about Black Friday. I feel like in years past I was very into Black Friday because there were always some cool tech gadgets that were coming out, or... There was some upgrade that I was ready for. Last year, I took um, advantage of an upgrade to an iPad Pro 9.7 inch, which Target had some great deals on, like a lot of, lot off, like $200 off or something. And then I was able to turn my previous iPad Pro, or no, iPad Air, got all Air Pro. I joked iPad Prayer, put the two together. But I remember I turned in my iPad Air. I didn't need a new iPad. People don't need new iPads. They're, they're totally fine for what you uh, need them to do. I mean, you don't want to be three, four generations behind, but I was in pretty good shape with that. And I had an iPad Air 2, actually, because I'm crazy with this as I talk about not needing new ones. The year before, I had sold my iPad Air to my aunt-in-law, Melanie's aunt, and I had gotten back, you know, I, she gave me like 150 for it. And then I also got them a Google Chromecast for their house and then went through the pain and toil of teaching them how to uh, fling shows from the iPad to the Google Chromecast. And when you're dealing with two ladies who are north of 65, one of them just north, I believe, and uh, the other in her early 90s, uh, my wife's grandma bet who's an amazing person and these two women sit in their living room which is in the front porch kind of foyer area of their house and they watch netflix night after night i'm amazed when they tell me oh we cleared through this show oh have you seen this show they are clearing netflix netflix shows at a binge rate that i can't even believe it's pretty amazing but i basically sold them my old ipad um and then got them a chromecast and they paid me for that and i got them all set up and trained and i had like a 30-day follow-up guarantee where they could call me no just kidding they were still calling me for a while but they've been able to do it so when they're able to do it anybody can do it and that's why black friday is a big deal because it can get you into a lot of this tech gear and even folks who have a steep learning curve can get there pretty quickly and up to speed and how you run it the only time they've ever called me is when there's one of those normal things where you just end up rebooting something and it works, but somebody who doesn't have that expertise or experience, because it's not expertise, it's just purely experience, you, you really learn that the majority of issues are fixed with a plug and unplug or a boot or reboot and uh, the thing works itself out because anything that is more complex than that is well beyond pretty much all of what we can do because we're not building these things, but... I had turned that in the year before, and then last year, I saw this deal at Target, and I dispatched my mom and my sister on their way home after Thanksgiving at our house here in Sparta on their way back to Mawa. There is a, a Target halfway, not off the beaten path. It is directly halfway on the first major highway that they take to get home, and they got in there, and my sister got one, and they got one for me, and that was my Christmas present, early Christmas present. So that was 200 off, and then I got another 150 I believe, for my iPad Air 2 from one of those sites that you can sell the, uh, the device to, and you can even get credit to something like, uh, like Amazon dollars, and when it comes in there as a gift certificate, you can even get 10% more as long as you're putting it towards Amazon dollars. So it all works out for me, and then I ended up getting the case, the smart case, which has been pretty useful, and an Apple Pencil, which... I have had no use for. I got it because I thought it was cool and it has sat in my backpack at the bottom uncharged, unused since probably the first two days I had it. I'm sure it's useful to people. I see a guy I work with named Mark using his and he's a major, um, uh, he's a great drawer. Uh, he can uh, he can draw comics. Uh, he can animate things. He's a perfect test case for the Apple Pencil, but I am not. I did not find a use for it. I was like, oh, I'll use it for notes. But notes don't really translate. If you're not if you're not putting notes like on a prototype or something, if you're just someone who literally takes notes, like meeting minutes or thoughts, it doesn't make sense. Just type them in on your little case you got. But I got it with the Amazon points, uh, the Amazon money I got from turning in the old iPad Air 2. 
And so it ended up being cost neutral. But this year, I came up upon Black Friday and I was looking for a little while leading up to it this week from Monday on, and there was just nothing that was striking my fancy. And I'm sure there are things that would be great for people, but for me, I literally have everything. I have all of the smart speakers. I even have the smaller versions. I have this version, that version, the rechargeable versions. I have uh, Echoes. I have a Google Home. Um, And really, the one thing that was going to come out in the smart speakers this year was the Apple HomePod. And that was announced, I think, earlier this week that it was going to be kicked into 2018, which is a real shame for Apple because this was supposed to be the time they would come out. It's the perfect gift for people who are in the Apple ecosystem. Very expensive gift. I believe it's $350, while the Echoes and Google Homes are in the $100, $150 range. Maybe the Google Echo is up, or sorry, Google Echo, the Amazon Echo is up towards 180 at retail, although you can always find deals on it. But the Apple HomePod is much more expensive, and people said, oh, well, the Fidelity is going to be amazing on it. I'll tell you, the Fidelity on the Google Home, the Fidelity on the Amazon Echo is totally fine for me. I'm not noticing differences. I'm not noticing Fidelity. I mean, they're really good speakers, and they're better than what's on the phone, and what's on the phone is really good. So it definitely does the trick for me, and when you're talking about the Amazon Echo, They were first to market with this this device. They got all the integrations with all the services I use. And uh, any that they don't have, you can just Bluetooth from your phone, from your tablet into it. And so you are completely covered. Um, And it's a really good device. The others are really playing catch up and we'll see if they can catch up. We'll see if they can bring features to the world of smart speakers that would give them more market share against Amazon. But Amazon is the one. But I was looking at these deals and I'm just looking and thinking, there's not a lot here for me to get. There's just not a lot of stuff. I was on The Verge today, a great tech site, and they have the Black Friday 2017, the 24 best deals. And again, I'm kind of looking through them and I'm seeing TVs. I don't need a TV. Uh, You know, I'm seeing one TV that's like supposedly a really good deal and it's instead of being... $1,597, $1,597, it's $1,497. Don't know if I would ever pay over 1000 for a TV at this point, um, even though I would pay for a phone, which is crazy, but obviously the phone is baked into your your phone plan, so you don't notice that total cost. Uh, we'll see if my wife notices the jump in our monthly cost of about $12. We'll see how quick that comes to her vision. Uh, I'm pretty sure it'll be pretty soon. But uh, I see Samsung TV, from six ninety nine to three ninety nine, I guess that's good. It's a fifty inch four K smart TV, sure. But I ju- again, I don't need TVs. I got enough, and it would be hard to justify getting one. And then you think, where am I going to put it? Do I put it in the basement here, where I don't even have the time to carve out to come down here and really watch stuff? I did watch two episodes of Luke Cage, the final two episodes of season one. Finally, when I was off on Friday because of my continued back ailment. I was uh, at a commission that day. I woke up in real bad pain, went to the chiropractor, thought I would go to the doctor. Bad deal with muscle spasms going on, <clears throat> scary levels of muscle spasms. So I took the day off. And when I came back from the chiropractor and I came back from getting some coffee, I just sat in the basement here, which is something I rarely do, except to do podcasts or to work out on the other side. But I have a beautiful little living room area here with the old sectional couch from my parents' house in Mawa. And the old TV that we used to keep in our living room. And it's funny, this TV is maybe 27 or 30 inches. And I used to feel like this was the biggest TV ever. And when I look back to the point, the early years we were living here, I would have that TV in our main room on the first floor. And it always felt so big. And then maybe, well, it was the year the Giants were in the Super Bowl. So that would have been Uh, just at the turn of 2012, it was the 2011 season into 2012 when they actually won the Super Bowl. I remember the week in between, you know, that off week between the division championships and the Super Bowl, I went out to Best Buy because I saw there was a great deal on TVs and I used the proceeds of profits that I uh, had accrued from uh, investing in Netflix. And I did really well. I invested in Netflix at one point and maybe like a thousand dollars or something. And I made like a thousand dollars on top of it. So I 
kind of justified in my head that I could use those profits to buy a TV. Hey, if Netflix, if this TV streaming TV service made you the money, you could go buy a television with it. So I went into Best Buy and I saw this great deal on a TV and it was like uh, 500 off or something. And then I saw that there was some will match it deal and I saw it was even more money off at Walmart. So I told the people at Best Buy and then I ended up getting this 60 inch enormous plasma TV. Now I'm not a TV file. Um, if that's the word pH file. So I don't know OLED. I don't know, um, you know, versus plasma versus HD retina. I I don't know that stuff a lot, but I saw a TV that's 60 inches. So the pure size of this will, uh, do quite some damage in a positive way in your living room. And I just bought it $798. I bought it right there on the spot. I somehow moved this enormous box into my car and then I got home and somehow moved it from the car into my living room and put it up on the old TV stand. And here it was this amazing 60 inch TV. And I remember turning it on at that point and putting on a college basketball game. And I felt like I was in the stadium. I was in the arena watching it and it felt absurd. It felt like the first time you got a 5.7 inch phone screen like uh, one of those Samsung Notes or one of those iPhone uh, Pluses when they came out, or as I have now, although it's funny, the form factor shrunk, but I have the iPhone 10. It's the same, if not bigger, slightly bigger screen size than the Plus, but the actual size of the device overall is basically the size of the normal phone. So it's a much smaller phone with an enormous screen. And it got me thinking, wait until iPhone comes out with the form factor of the plus, but with the screen um, feature or format of this iPhone 10, it will be an enormous, it's coming. I, I guarantee it. It hit me because I'm looking at this. I'm going, oh, this is amazing to have a bigger screen, but on the smaller form factor. And then I was like, wait a sec, they're totally going to come out with the plus size. And then the screen will be like six and a half inches. But when I had that TV, I just looked at it and I said, whoa, this is just out of control. And I remember my wife came home and one, she was shocked that I was able to get this TV out and set up because it it really was so big. But I get fixated on things when I get something and I get so fixated that I'm not going to wait for help. I'm going to do it by any means necessary. I will get injured in the process. I will get a hernia if I have to. I will do things that make me feel like an addict or an aholic of some sort to do it, to set it up. And I did that. And I remember she came home and she was like, oh my God, what did you do? It felt that big. And then I remember taking that TV that was there and I moved it into the basement here. And now you look at this little TV, little, right? This used to be my big screen TV. And now this TV's down here and it feels like one of those tiny little you know, seven or eight inch screens you used to have in your room as a little kid where the TV was enormous, but the actual screen was small. No bevel. Isn't that the word? But I'm looking at this. I'm going, wow, I could get one of those. But you start justifying into your head. Why am I going to get this? Should I get this? Oh, it'll change my life in this case. And then you use it twice a year when you're sick or out of work because it doesn't fit into your life to come down here and just watch hours of TV. And even in the points where I could think of coming down here when everyone's asleep, when my son's down, if it's a night where my wife is tired and goes to sleep early, I end up just going to the first floor. It feels more comfortable. There's something almost going into a cave, like stark about coming down to the basement when it's too late at night. It feels weird. Like I feel comfortable on that first floor. Almost feels warmer. Uh, It feels like I'm closer to getting to bed when it's ready, even though I fall asleep there. But you justify these things. You just don't need it. And so it's good to just convince yourself to not get it, to not need it. Um, So that's where I kind of am with that. So I look at TVs and I go, I don't know. And I see there's one here, an Insignia 50-inch 4K smart TV. Look, 4K is a big deal when you get it. 4K blows your mind. Like when you watch 4K, you almost feel like the definition is more surreal than actual real life when you're watching it. Because my parents have one uh, at their house in Mawa. And so when I go over there, I'll fire up Netflix or I'll, you know, they have a Chromecast set up on that TV so I can just fling things to it and I'll watch it. And you're like, whoa, this almost doesn't even seem like the TV show. 
Like it's so surreal. And I don't have that in any room in my house. So there is something to get in that 4K thing where you can watch it and you can really experience that format. But this one has a Roku in it. So that's cool. But I already have the Roku device. I have uh, a Roku 3, I believe. So it just doesn't make sense to jump in no matter what the price is. And I don't know how many people out there would be the target audience for these deals who don't already have something that fills or fits the niche for them. It's hard to figure. Um, TVs are in a tough spot. TVs are just another commodity at this point. There's really nothing they can bring to the table. And remember, Apple was supposed to go into TVs and then came out just like Apple was supposed to go into cars and they've sort of backed out of that. You wonder if they realize the margins aren't there to make a killing on it because everybody else is giving something that's at least 90 to 95% there on what they want to give. And they're not going to be able to charge that premium price because the market is flooded with all of these televisions that even though Apple comes out with one, are people really going to pay double what they could pay from a Samsung TV or an LG or a Vizio or an Insignia? That's probably why they're out. Gaming is a big one. I just don't play games. I don't play PlayStation. I don't play Xbox. I don't, you know, the Oculus Rift is here, all these different games that are cheaper I'm sure I would love games. I used to play them when I was younger, but I was younger. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have a kid. I had massive amounts of time. I could stay up all night and you get on a bender with these things and you just start playing. And then all of a sudden your night's gone and you're exhausted and you're chippy and you're irritable. And so I stay away from games. I have, I do always think, man, I'd love to just get back into like Madden or FIFA or basketball, NBA games. But I just don't do it because I barely have the time. As I said, I barely have the time to come to this basement and watch an hour or two hours of Luke Cage or a Marvel series. Just started The Punisher. That is a good looking show. I'm about two thirds or three quarters of the way through the first episode. That is a good show. I can't wait to keep watching it when I get the time. If I get sick again, if I hurt my back again, I know I'll be able to watch it at that point. But I don't have the time, so I can't really add gaming into the mix. It just becomes something that's untenable. Now, then I got down to tablets and laptops and I'm going, eh, I don't need a micro. I'm not going to get into Microsoft Surface. They got the Surface laptop. My boss swears by this thing. You can get it for $900. It's usually $1,079. Sorry, not $900, $899. Looks a lot better down from the $1,079. I already got a really good Dell computer. uh, Sorry, computer. I really got a good Dell laptop. Very premium feeling. I have no problems with this. As I've said in the past, iOS is all me on mobile, but when I get to computers, I'm a Windows person because I work in a Windows company, and because of that, I can get personal laptops at like 50% of the price uh, because we have... uh, you know, we have retailer deals or reseller deals, sorry. And so because we have these reseller deals, we can then um, take advantage of those personally. And so I have a really high level, probably a $2,500 to $3,000 laptop that I'm able to have for about $1,500. So for me to buy one on the open market for the price that I'm paying now, it's not going to be anywhere as good a computer experience as I can get through this. And I've always been Windows at work and I've always been Windows on laptops. So it's just what I know. However, I'm looking down this list, and even though I said, oh, I'm not excited about any deals, there's always one that gets you. And for me, I'm looking on this list, and I see Apple 15.4-inch MacBook Pro with Touch Bar. So it's the late 2016 model, which I think is the most up-to-date model, and they got it for $17.99, down from $23.99. Then there's an addendum note that through November 26th, it's further discounted to $15.99. So all of a sudden I'm looking at this and I'm saying to myself, wow, that's an $800 discount on the computer. And then I'm saying to myself, hmm, much like I've always thought, boy, it would be neat to try out the Android experience on the mobile platform because I've always been iOS. Obviously it's been 10 years now that I've basically been iOS. I've been since the beginning. Um, and the iPhone did come out in 2007. So for the most part, I've been in this Apple ecosystem on mobile, on my iPhones, on my iPads, on my iPad minis, on my pros, on my airs, all of them on one, two, three, four of the normal iPads. I've been in this world for 10 years. And so I've always been, um, interested to flirt, to be flirtatious with Android, just to experience something a little different, just to get some, uh, spice of life. And I never have 
because I get close and then you realize that the transition pains are going to be too much. And the differences in the phones are now minimal. There's not a lot of differences because they all want to get to the cell point. And that means converging to the point where sometimes when I see a Google Pixel phone, I think it's an iPhone. I At my coffee place is a guy named Dave who is a high-level person at Google in New York. And he has a Pixel, which makes sense working at Google, although he does have an, uh, a MacBook, which is kind of funny. And I'll look at it, and I remember one day I said, oh, that's an iPhone, right? He goes, oh, no, it's a Pixel. And I looked a little closer. I said, oh, my God, yes, it is. But now when you get to the new iPhone 10 and it doesn't even have the home button or anything, these things, you can't tell the difference between them. So the difference is so minimal that is it worth it to up sticks and go into a whole new operating system where you need to rebuy a lot of the apps, where you need to re-download a lot of the other apps, uh, where you need to find substitutes for apps that don't exist there. If I'm thinking of like Overcast, the podcast app I use, um, that is my that is the podcast app I love. Now, there are options like Pocket Cast, which can get you a lot of the benefits of an Overcast, Smart Speed, Smart Boost. But I love Overcast, and I love the experience I have in Apple, and I love the iMessage. So you're locked in this walled garden because you continually use the services. I have the I, the uh, Apple Watch. You can't, really wor- you can't work that with um, Google, Android. You could get an Android watch, but then I'm moving over there. It's too many decisions. I've talked about this in the past. The decision points take you past the the point of the flirtation. It's like having a baby on the first night, and then you go, well, I guess we're getting together. I guess this is going to have to work out, huh? And you could have a lifetime of just um, a suboptimal experience. So because of that, um, I've always been Apple. I've always been iOS. Even though the mind wants to wander, the mind wants to try other things, Apple keeps keep uh, keeps spicing up the relationship. I'm loving the iPhone 10. I'll probably do a podcast about that pretty soon. Loving it. Just completely love it. Is it changing my life? No. But it has it made it slightly improved in the experience of life that I need from a mobile phone? It sure has. And it's, a again, great form factor. But I've always been Windows. But I've always wanted to flirt into the Apple world because I love the iOS so much. And I love the Apple experience. I love the way things look. I'm used to the language on the iOS platform, the mobile platform, which would parlay itself pretty well, I think, to the desktop uh, operating system, which I don't even know that world. So to me, it's like something wholly new while being something a little familiar, Uh, almost like dating a wife's twin. I'm sorry, (laughs) dating a wife's twin like dating twins or something, you know, where they're a little different, but they're a little the same. And so I see this Apple 15.4 inch MacBook Pro, the newest one. It's got this touch bar. I don't know a lot about that, even though a lot of people have kind of criticized it. I'm thinking, does it have the USB connections I need? But this price, I might get it. So I'm joking here about how I never use, I ne- you know, I'm not into this Black Friday. Like there's not the deal for me from the past ones. There's not the upgrade that makes sense. And again, I sort of did get my up, my sort of Black Friday-ish upgrade earlier this month when I got the iPhone 10. That would have been something I would have upgraded to, and I already did. Love it. But I'm telling you, this might be something I, I want to I wanna get in bed with here. And I'm thinking, well, my wife's been using my Dell laptop, so I could maybe move that down to her, and then she has a laptop, and then I can have my Apple. I could be fully immersed in the Apple world in the Apple operating system from from uh, desktop to mobile to watch. I mean, every OS they have. And then you're sitting there going, what a turd I am. I'm going to be walking into my coffee shop and I'm going to have my, I'm going to pull out my, my MacBook Pro. I'm going to have my iPad Pro. I'm going to have my, my iPad mini. I'm going to have my iPhone 10. I'm going to have my Apple Watch. Two, I'm going to have my AirPods. And then you're just like, man, what a dork. But if you love it, you love it. So you kind of stay in it. Makes a lot of sense. So all that said, I might end up taking part in a <laughs> in a Black Friday deal. I, I, that deal is almost too good to be true. And that's where it needs to get to. You need to have the deal that makes it worth your while. And BNH here, who is coming out with this deal, they're coming hard. They're coming strong. I might have to jump on that. $800 off a MacBook Pro? I hope it's not like uh, refurbished. I don't think it is. I think it only said they're a reseller, but I I just might want to do that. So um, 
the other things like the home uh, the home speakers, Google Home Mini is twenty nine dollars. So that's Google's version of the Echo Dot, which is like a real small. Although the Google one, you see the commercials with um, is it Nick Kroll and then the blonde woman from Saturday Night Live. I don't remember, but um, so was it Parks and Rec? That that might be what it is. I never watched that show. Is it good? Um, but uh, this Google Home is like a little pod, very small, like a puck. Now, it makes me think the speaker on it's pretty good because the speaker on the Echo Dot is not great. It's good for the um, when the smart speaker talks to you, but when you try to play music on it, it's not great. But what it's for, uh, ultimately, is to either Bluetooth it into a real speaker or to hook it through the 3.5 millimeter um, jack into a speaker, which I do with an old speaker I had for my... Uh, serious when I actually had the serious face that you would move from the little boom box to your car. Um, so I still have that boom box. And so I plug a dot into the boom box in the office and then I'm able to have both things playing with each other. It's really good. So this is Google homes version, $29 and includes a $10 store credit. See for me, when these things are already cheap where they're under 50 bucks, you're getting an amazing deal by taking $20 off because $20 off of Fifty dollars is that's forty percent, right? Because twenty of fifty would be forty of a hundred. So you're you're looking at forty percent off. But when it's forty nine dollars to twenty nine dollars, it doesn't feel like that big of a deal. And that's why I wonder who were the holdouts who were like, "Look, I'm not going to get into the Google Home Mini for forty nine, but twenty nine I might." See, for me, the people who are going to want this anyway are like, "Well, the forty nine is already a low enough price point." So. Maybe people make an impulse purchase, but I think a lot of people who wouldn't want this but want it because the price goes down and they make uh, an impulse purchase on it are not going to be people who are even going to understand how it works. You almost need early adopters still for a lot of these. They're not as intuitive as like when the iPhone came out and it was like swipe up, swipe down, hit home button. Everything sort of made sense. And that's why uh, babies and toddlers can use these things so intuitively older people like our parents, like our grandparents can sort of use these pretty intuitively. They're not like computers where you have to have some base of knowledge to understand how to work them. They really work out for people. And I wonder with these, like these mini speakers, there's a lot you have to do. You need to download an app to your phone or your tablet. You need to, you need to um, authenticate into different apps that can then be available in the speaker. You need to know the response or you need to know the right things to say to the speaker to get it going. The learning curve is still kind of a lot. Once you get to the point where you understand how it all works, very simple, very intuitive and, and, and user friendly, but to get there is not easy. So I don't know who these impulse buyers who are like, Oh, 29, I'm going to get it. At 49, the price point's already good. So who, you know, I don't know. The Echo, second generation Echo, the newest one, uh, it's an improvement on the ones I have, which are first gen. And I think I, I mean, I got those for deals, but I think they retailed at like one, either 160 or 180. This second generation Echo has like a felt kind of feel to the outside of it. A lot, uh, a lot nicer, a lot more kind of inviting. I don't know if it's mesh or felt or whatever, but these are $80 down from 99. So again, 99, 99 is a good price based off of the first generation Echoes. So quite a difference in price point there, some improvements. And then when you add this down to 79, 99, it's pretty much a hundred dollars less than the first generation Echo retailed at Roku streaming stick. Uh, $48 down from $69. If you're not in smart television yet, it's a really good product to get. So we're talking, we're talking Google Chromecast. We're talking Apple TV. We're talking Google TV has one and we're talking Roku set top boxes and stick. And then we're talking Amazon also has a set top box and stick. So the stick are like these little dongles that can plug right into your TV in one of the ports, one of the HDMI ports. And then you use your phone or a remote that I think comes with some of these, or you can pay to add on to others. Maybe Amazon is a, is an add on. And then you can interact with these little dongles right on your screen, on your TV screen with a remote or with your phone. And you can pretty much play anything you could on any streaming service like Hulu, um, uh, well, not iTunes, but like Amazon has a place where you could obviously Amazon Prime has TV. You can buy things at retail to bring into it, rent movies, rent TV shows that aren't part of Prime, Netflix. 
uh, you know, the different sports services that are available. They're pretty much available on all these. Um, now, there's not a lot of intermingling of of native content. So like things you might buy on Google, like on Google's storefront, rent movies, buy TV shows, rent TV shows, buy movies. You can't put those like on a, um, on an Amazon program because they're, Amazon has their own version of that. So the good thing with Roku, why you might want to get a Roku is it's pretty much agnostic. It's, it's, it's a service. It's actually a public IPO service. It's on, uh, it's on the stock market you can buy into it. It's created by the guy who created DVR. And so they were first in the game with this. They were originally a streaming, uh, box for Netflix, pretty much for Netflix and then built out from there. So they don't have, uh, they'll bring in their own kind of services or make deals with services to offer their own kind of native content, but mostly they are a platform for which everybody can come on and and sell their content or, or show their authenticated content. So Roku is a really good one to be in because you know pretty much the majority of the content places uh, that you have to authenticate in, you can get to. Uh, it's not the case with a lot of them. I mean, you think about iTunes or you think about the Apple TV and Amazon still doesn't have an app on there and they're a major, they're a prime player. <laughs> um, so they're up there with the Netflixes. So they're not on there. You can airplay right now and they're, there was um, discussion that Amazon will be coming to Apple TV with an app, but they're not even there yet. So it's those kind of things where you run into these, uh, where, you, where you kind of run into these these dissonances between different services. So Roku allows you to play everything. So Roku ends up being a really good service. You're pretty safe. You're fu- future proof. You have a public company. Um, and you have a place that really is trying to innovate it, innovate in the TV sphere. Philips Hue white starter kit. So those must be those smart, um, light bulbs. And, and so with the smart light bulbs, you can use your phone to turn them on. You can hook them into these different smart speakers. So you can speak to the echo or you could speak to a Google home. You got to look deeper into where the integrations are, but you can basically tell them to be turned on through these speakers or you can turn them on through your phone. That's kind of neat. They're, they're down, uh, what's about $60 down from a hundred dollars. Um, and I don't know what this Nvidia shield TV is weird. Uh, the Sonos one is 174 down from 199.99. I think Sonos one is the one that has C, uh, it has, a, a Amazon echo. It has the smart, the smart assistant of echo in it. So it's a Sonos level speaker, which are great speakers, uh, from what people say, audio files, but it has the Amazon echo basically, uh, digital assistant, uh, as the platform within it or as this, as the software within it. And I heard that there's actually going to be like integration somehow with Google's assistant and then maybe with Siri at some point. So I don't know how that's going to work, but that might almost be that kind of Roku thing where Roku can bring in everybody because they're not any of those people. This might be like for Sonos, they might actually have an advantage down the road because you can bring in all your smart assistants into the one. So that's something to watch. There's an iPad pro deal. There's an ultimate ears boom too. That's a big deal. I don't know what those are. Ultimate ears are probably headphones. Uh, that's a big deal though. Oh no, it's a Bluetooth speaker, but it's down, it's 120, you save $120. That's pretty good. So that would be like one of those little things that you could actually Bluetooth to an echo dot and make that speaker smart. That's pretty neat. That's a big deal. But I, you know, I don't need those things. I got everything. But again, I'm sitting here saying I don't need anything. And then all of a sudden I'm ready to deal. (laughs) And that's how Black Friday works. It'll find all of you. There's a deal waiting for you somewhere, no matter where you look. So Thanksgiving was yesterday. How was your Thanksgiving? I hope it was well. Mine was pretty good. Although I'll tell you what, I don't love Thanksgiving. I like it a lot. The thing I, the things I do love about it are it's a four day weekend. There's football. There's food and the holiday itself is at the front end of the four days. So that's really cool. It's not like you have a four day weekend and it's on the Friday or it's on the Sunday, which would be the worst because then you got to go to work the next day. It's on the front end. So that's great. So it means starting Wednesday night, you can start to sort of be like the college version of yourself going to bed late. If you're able to, if you're able to stay up, um, 
and you kind of have a good four days to reset yourself. Your whole domestic situation, not domestic, like in a country point of view, America is all uh, taking part in this. So it's not like a vacation in the summer where your company is still working and your clients are still working and you're off and you feel like you're kind of letting down your company be, by being on vacation. It is one where everybody stops, especially on Thanksgiving itself. There is nothing going on from work. It's as free a feeling as you can have from professional duties and responsibilities. That to me is amazing. But I'll tell you what, for me, there's a lot of waiting around and I don't like that. There's not a lot you can do. I can't break off and go really get coffee because so many places are closed. Um, My we we host at our house, so not only on Thursday but on Wednesday too. I took off Wednesday one because my back is you know as I've said in the past few episodes, my back is in bad shape. It's coming around. It's doing better. I'm taking a lot of stuff. I'm going to my chiropractor. I'm almost there, I think, but I'm not there enough. I still got like a bad bad feeling at one disc that I can't shake and I will shake it, but I took off, but taking off isn't the same when you got kids. It's just not the same. You actually have more downtime. You have more leisure time when you go to work than you do when you're home with kids on quote unquote vacation days. I often find that being home and I just have one, I just have a toddler who just turned three, which in its own right is very difficult to be honest. But When you have a toddler and you're in control of them, pretty much on your own, or even with your wife, but but especially on your own, because when you have a toddler, it's sort of like a a baton passing where it's like, I'm going to go do this, then I'm going to come and watch my son, my wife's going to go do this, maybe we're all going to do this one thing together, but everything is like regimented, scheduled, you go here, I go here, we go here, lunch, park, breakfast, uh, potty, nap dinner, like everything is so regimented that you really can't let your mind kind of free to create and to think and to contemplate. It's difficult. And I've, I, I was almost looking for an analogy of what it's like. And it, it made me feel like on the Wednesday where I'm quote unquote off and my wife and her mother are at our house and they're preparing the food. So they are not in play with my son at all. And then on top of it, he didn't nap at all. So there was no time when they don't nap on top of it. First of all, they're then going to be extremely cranky. They're very hard to please. There's nothing they that you can offer that they want to do. There's nothing you can coerce them to do. It's pretty much you can allow them to try to watch TV on end, which isn't good. Um, and then they even get like very uh, inert to that where they'll be halfway through an episode and then they just want to go break something or they want to go cry or scream or say they want to do this or eat or it's hard. It's almost like working in a restaurant, being a, a waiter in a restaurant and working a double. So working, coming in at the noon shift and then not leaving till the restaurant closes out at two. And then on top of it, you have cranky customers and you have a short staffed kitchen. So you are on the front line, customer service, dealing with the patrons and then not only dealing with them on even ground, but dealing with them while they're cranky and while your, your kitchen is short staffed. So they're not going to get their food in the normal uh, time they should. And so you're constantly going back, seeing if they need new drinks, knowing that their food should be there. It's really hard. It's really stressful and there's not much relaxing about it. And it made me think, man, these people who watch our kids during the day, whether it's school, whether it's a nanny, whether it's our parents, you know, they're the kids' grandparents, they are saints because you give me one day with this kid who I love with all my life, with all my heart, love him completely, want nothing but his goodwill at the front of all of my interests. When I'm with him a full day and then if he doesn't nap, I'm like, I'm ready to rip my hair out. It's, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to keep different activities going. Uh, it's so hard to find a way to just settle for a moment, to have them do like a puzzle or play with their cars. And maybe it looks like they're locked in playing with their cars. And then three minutes in, right when you've sat down, tried to look at a little something, read a magazine, which I do. I subscribe to magazines, the hard copy, so that if they're doing something and you want to sit and do your own thing, I'm reading a magazine so they don't think I'm looking at my phone or my tablet, which they're going to want, by the way, when you're playing with it, that's the first thing they want. And they also don't think that you're just ignoring them. They see you reading something. That's something you want them to do to read real things. So I figure 
not only getting the discount that uh, subscribing to a hard copy gets you, you get a discount by subscribing to that because, or, or to get to the digital version of the magazine, because the publisher likes the idea for advertisers that they have a hard copy out there and they have the digital version. It's good for them, so they make it good for you. So I do that, but then all of a sudden you start reading your two paragraphs in, and then the kid is either needy because he thinks you're doing something else, or because he's bored playing the cars wasn't as fun as it is. And then you try to put on some TV, you try to get them through this, through that, to get get them to lunch. Everything is is time synced to get you from point to point. And for me, when I take them to school three days a week, and I'm with them only in the morning, when I take them to school, all I have to do is get him from basically 7 a.m. to 8.05, because that's when we leave for school. So it's not that hard to do that over an hour and five minutes, right? You got a you got a breakfast there. Maybe you got a half of a Daniel Tiger episode. All of a sudden, you're getting him ready. You're getting his stuff ready, his backpack ready, his food ready. You get his uh, jacket on. I get his car seat in, and then we're gone. And that can be hard to negotiate. There's nothing like negotiating with a toddler. It's like a terrorist. They're both T's. Very difficult to negotiate because they're not on even ground with you. They'll tell you they're going to, you say, all right, we'll do this. And you'll go to the potty and they go, okay. And then you do the thing they want to do and they go, I'm not going to the potty and you go, okay. And then they just pee their pants and then you go, wow, I'm extremely frustrated. But me yelling at a toddler doesn't do anything. It's very hard. It's, it's very hard. It makes you, it makes you reassess everything in your life when you lose negotiation after negotiation with a toddler. But I know I can sprint for that hour and five minutes and then I'm passing them off to a school. Then they're at the school for a couple hours and then they move on to their grandmothers or on the days I give real credit to our nanny. I know she's getting paid for it, but I give credit to her. She watches our son the whole day from like 8.30 to 5.30. Yes, there's a three hour nap potentially in the middle there. Yes, you can go out. She's really good. Take him to places even for her own stuff. Um, and so you can, you can kind of move through the time pretty well. You got enough events in the day that get you through to things, but I give her credit. It's hard. I, if I were like with them all day, you can see how some of these people go crazy or how some of these moms or not to be sexist because there can be at home dads too. But you see when you, you kind of hear that little, uh, that urban legend or that, 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 that story, that narrative of the mom who just gets to five o'clock to get her glass of wine. You can see that because it is like a double shift at a restaurant as a waiter with cranky customers and a short kitchen staff. That's what it's like all day. And that's a good day. Actually, a good day is pretty much where they're well-rested. No, you know what it is? A good day is when you still have the short kitchen staff, but the, but the customers are happy. It's a Friday night. You're keeping them flowing with drinks. So they're happy. They don't mind the wait as much. They're willing to be there. But it's hard. I mean, it's amazingly hard. You wonder how people have more kids. And I want to, and I've, as I talked about in the last episode, it's very sad, our loss in that respect. But being real here, being honest, it's tough. And so I was with him that whole Wednesday. I was with him the whole past weekend because my wife had a conducting seminar. I've been with him a lot and it's, it's tough. You get no time to yourself to do anything. And you need to be on your game when you're with them because you're developing them right now. You're developing their behaviors. You're developing their um, how they're going to, you know, basically exist in their life, uh, from a polite point of view, from their actions, from how they treat others. And you got to cut them off at the pass when they're doing things bad. And then you have to let them do some things that are bad because they're still unformed toddlers. It's who it's tough. But so because of that, Thanksgiving is not as, um, relaxing as you would think. Because when you're hosting, not only do you have all that prep that my wife and her mother do, but then I'm watching my son the whole time. I'm exhausted at night, so I don't even stay up and do that much stuff for myself because I pass out from having to do this double shift with the short staff and the cranky customers. And so I just pass out at night, a couple drinks. I got my back thing going on, so those couple of drinks make things worse. They dehydrate you. They make your... They make you get spasms. They make you wake up feeling like your back's broken and just from a couple drinks of wine. Um, But then you roll into Thursday and your day starts at 7 a.m. and you're not going to be eating that dinner until 3.34. So you're looking at a whole work day before you're going to eat and you're then going to be in charge of your son again because the prep continues. Even though they said it would all be done on Wednesday, 
there's a lot that needs to be done apparently on Thursday. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, let's rearrange your entire spice rack and we'll move it into this new drawer. And you're like, guys, I'm just here. Like, I know it seems like there's the opening to just do whatever you want here to, you know, how we got all this free time, but I'm here with a toddler. Can someone come here and just kind of hang out a little bit? I got some things to do. I got to create some stuff. And so I, I tried to take him out in the morning and he said, no, uh, he's cranky. The kitchen is uh, short staffed again. He does not want to go out. And so I said, guys, I'm going out. I need to break this monotony a little bit. I can't be in this house the whole day. These are the reasons I don't like Thanksgiving. I give thanks for it. I love parts of it. But when you're hosting, it's tough because you're in that restaurant the whole day. And then by the time everyone gets there to have the good time and the frivolity, you're just like, man, I'm, I'm beat. And all I'm thinking about is the cleanup. And so I'm trying to keep people there to keep the cleanup going because there is so much to clean up. You make like three many two or uh, three many two. You make uh, three too many enormous vats of green beans and you're trying to figure out do we have enough Tupperware to hold it? Do we got enough to hold all this turkey to hold these 35 desserts people brought? And then you're kind of keeping people corralled because you're like, you are not leaving us with this mess. I've spent a double. I'm not going for a triple. And so this is the difficulty with Thanksgiving is when you deal with this hosting, when you go somewhere, it's amazing. You leave to get there a half hour before dinner. You eat the dinner, you drink, you take part and you take advantage of all the food that's made that you didn't have to take part in. And then when it's over, get some dessert, pass out on the couch. Oh, we're going. Okay, let's go. You don't even look behind you to see what's left. You're gone. And it's hard when, when you're, when it's someone else's house, it's like, it's, it's hard to imagine cleaning that all up. And all you do is head back to your home. Everything's clean there and you're good. But that's kind of the tough thing. That's the tough thing with all this is that when you host, it's never easy and you got to hold enough in reserves for the cleanup. Because if you are too buzzed, if you're too full on turkey, if you're too full on dessert, you're then tired, you're coming down on the wrong side of all of that buzz and all of that overeating. And now you got to figure out how to get tables back into the basement, how to, how to get this like 3,500 pounds of food into already stuffed refrigerators inside and outside. And then you're thinking, man, I'm never going to eat this stuff, but where do we put it? And then everyone leaves and they're like, no, we don't need that enormous dessert we made. We don't need these 13 cookie pies. No, you guys have them. I'm sure you can have them. It's like, no, we can't. Do you see how little of a dent we made in this dessert with 11 people here? How little? We're not even going to get through one of these halfway. And then we're going to be left having to throw it all out in a week. And it's going to be another point where you're still paying for that. I sound so ungrateful. I'm not ungrateful. Thanksgiving is great. (laughs) Totally great. But I'll tell you what, to end here. You know why it's Black Friday for me today? Because to try to add some juice to Thanksgiving, I bet on football games. I bet on football games every week. And I don't bet on them like calling into a bookie. I'm part of a uh, a pick'em league. <clears throat> it's called the Prognosticators Pool. It's run by a very generous gentleman named Adam Freeman. He works in the music, uh, the high school music industry, or the you know the educational music industry. Uh, in another school from my wife and has intersected with my wife on region band type deals and area band and all that. And he's a really good guy. Like him a lot. Interact with him when I see him out there. We interact on Facebook a little. And he has this really great league with a lot of people in it. And the way this Pick'em League works is you have all of your games, you know, for the net, for the coming weekend. And obviously for Thanksgiving, you got the three on Thanksgiving and then the rest of them on uh, Sunday, and then the one on Monday night. And you have the favorites, and you have the underdogs, and then you have the line, right? So on the first game, for instance, on Thanksgiving was Minnesota minus three at Detroit. So that means that if you pick Minnesota to win, they also have to win by more than three for your bet to play out. You can pick Detroit, even if you don't think they're going to win, But if you think at least they're going to lose by only two or one points. And so uh, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, let me go all in on the Thanksgiving Day games so that 
I have something I'm really locked in on all day. There's a lot more riding on these games. There's a lot more that's keeping me interested. And I can get off to a great start. And I could get my one win that I get every year. I get one win in a week. And that one win pays off your initial investment, which is $85. You get $100 by winning for the week. So you make 15 at the end of the year. And it makes you feel good about winning one week. And I haven't won this week yet. Or I haven't won this year yet. But on further, how the way this works is you have 10 bets. So you don't have to pick every game. You have 10 bets. So this week there were, let's see, sell seven to sell 20. So there's what, like, is that 13 or 14 games? So you have 13 or 14 games to pick against the 10 slots. And then Monday night is its own slot. And each slot on the one to 10 is in order of points. So the, the, the game you feel the best about The pick you feel the best about, you put in the number one slot, and that pick can get you 20 points. The number two slot, the one you feel next best about, next most confident about, you get 18. Then 16, 14, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, all the way to the bottom. And on Monday night, it's a 10-point pick. So whoever you pick there with the points, you get 10 points if you win it. If the team... Uh, if the score is right on the line, you get half of the points you picked. So if I picked, if I picked Minnesota or Detroit and the game was 27-24, either one of those picks would get me 10 points on the 20-point line. So I thought to myself, let me really go in on Thanksgiving. Let's have a lot in here. Let's get off to a great start. Let's win the week on Thanksgiving. So on my number one line and my number two line, I picked two of the games. And then on the number 10 line, which is the lowest points, I picked the other game just to have something in on it. And I thought to myself, we had Minnesota at Detroit minus three. And I'm like, wow, Minnesota getting th- or Minnesota uh, giving three points to Detroit at Detroit at 1230 Eastern time on Thanksgiving on a short week, on a short day. Against a really good quarterback in Matthew Stafford with a spare tire quarterback in Case Keenum. Spare tire, why do I say that? Because I always think backup quarterbacks are like spare tires. When you're in a pinch, if your tire goes flat, you can put that donut spare tire on there and it's going to get you where you're going perfectly fine. But don't look to wake up the next day and to be woken up the next week and still be on that donut because bad things are going to happen. It's not meant to go for long distances. It's not meant to be ridden for a long time. And that was my feeling with Case Keenum. I've seen a lot of Case Keenum. I saw a lot of him last year with the Los Angeles Rams, when I, not only in the season, but when I was watching that All or Nothing show and when I was watching Hard Knocks because they were in the Hard Knocks preseason and then All or Nothing in the regular season. And you saw what he did and he had a similar situation with the great defense and he kind of got the team out, I think, to three and one and then he sort of self-destructed. And so I'm thinking, boy, it's time for Case Keenum to self-destruct. He's making $2 million this year. He was basically the backup to a team that has two starting quarterbacks in Sam Bradford and Teddy Bridgewater. Everyone might know that story of why that's the case. Keenum. (laughs) No, but uh, they have these two starting quarterbacks, high level or thought of as high level starting quarterbacks. And they have both of them because Teddy Bridgewater went out uh, before last season where he basically ripped up everything in his knee and was going to be out for the whole year. And he was only available to start playing a week ago. So into the next November, was he only able in the point to start playing again? So he's sort of a, he's an above average quarterback. Uh, he can scramble a bit, got a good arm, a uh, decent arm, uh, can, can super manage a team. And then when they lost him last year, they got Sam Bradford, who was sort of available in Philly because they had drafted Carson Wentz. Uh, with the t- with their top pick there. They trade up, I think, to get Carson Wentz. And they gave him the reins right away by trading Sam Bradford to Minnesota, and they got like a first-round pick for him. So they got these two quarterbacks uh, who are major quarterbacks, and then they kind of brought in Case Keenum as a uh, insurance policy. Well, that insurance policy has paid out and paid out well. But we're kind of waiting to find out, is he a real tire or is he just a donut? Was he the thing that filled in and did well, uh, waiting for your real quarterback? Or is this thing, are we letting this tire ride? Are we going to go to California with this tire? Are we going to keep this donut going as far as it can go? And it looks like they're keeping the donut as far as it can go. So for all these reasons, I'm like, wow, I'm going with Detroit. They're playing on their home field. People are probably mad. Uh, Minnesota's probably mad to be playing on Thanksgiving. Detroit always plays on it, so they're used to it, just as Dallas does. 
which was the next game. So for these reasons, being at home, always playing this game, Minnesota having to travel in on a short week. I know it's not long travel, but traveling in on a short week on a short day, 1230, uh, you know, right past noon on Thanksgiving. I think this is a layup. And then three points on top of it given to Detroit. I thought Detroit would actually win. And they went down big early. And then they got all the way back, 27-23, I believe. And that was when we went in to eat. And so I'm sitting there going, oh, man, this was my number two pick. This was my 18-point pick. So they lost. Detroit lost 30-23, to I believe, to the, to the donut quarterback, Case Keenum. And so I said, oh, phew, losing an 18-pointer is really tough. But I said, hey, I still got my number one line. I got Dallas. I'm like, wow, Dallas in a pick em against the Los Angeles Chargers, the most inconsistent team. Uh, not only is not only are the Chargers having to move to a new city, which is only like a hundred and some odd miles away from their old city. So they're relocated there. Or in Philip Rivers case, he stayed in his San Diego home, but has this vehicle drive him up to, uh, he has this driver and this really souped up vehicle with where he can watch his game tape in the vehicle on the hour and a half ride each way or more. Um, it's a weird situation. They've been very inconsistent this year. They lose all these close games that they should win. They're kind of like a, a they're, they're the, you know, they're the inveterate like shootout team. They're always the team in the shootout and then they lose at the end. So I'm thinking, man, this is a pick them at Dallas. Again, Dallas being the home team, always playing this game. The Chargers coming in, they're already a relocated team. Uh, and now they're having to go across the country to a degree on Thanksgiving, on a short week, same kind of uh, thinking, um, same kind of rationale I had for the first game. And I'm like, not only, not only, uh, there's not even points, it's a pick them. This is easy. Dallas has to get back up off the mat a little bit if they're meant to make it a season. And I think they are meant to make it a little bit of a season. Doesn't mean I think they're going to make the playoffs, but I feel like they're more competitive than that. I mean, it's a team that won like 13 games last year. And I know that Ezekiel Elliott is out now, and I think it's proven that he was way more of a fulcrum of their team than we thought. We thought that Dak was at least a part of that fulcrum. And they got freaking smoked. I think it was like, what, 28-3 to or something? They got completely smoked. So now I'm sitting there going, I put everything I had, 28-6, sorry, I forgot three points. I put everything I had into this day, into this Thanksgiving, where I'm like, I'll get a head start. I'm going to make $100 this week. I'm going to go all in. And then I'm like, (laughs) by the after four o'clock games, I'm now a bottle of wine in, I'm overfed, I'm probably on dessert at this point, I know what's ahead of me with having to still do cleanup, I'm tired, I'm not going to be able to watch anything because I'm going to be too tired and pass out, my back's going to be balky the next day from not having enough water, and now I've lost all these games. So then I'm thinking, oh hey, the Giants are still here, the team I root for, they only have two wins this year, they're like two and eight. And they're going into Washington. So I said, you know what? This is going to be the game. This is going to be the game where I pick the traveling team. Washington is a seven and a half point favorite. I'm not saying I think the Giants are going to win, although I think it's possible. But if the Giants even lose by a touchdown, I still win that bet picking them. And they're kind of in it for the whole game. And then I didn't even watch the end. And I woke up and they lost 20 to 10. So now... I have lost uh, I have lost a potential 40 points already. I didn't win one of these games. So not only do I pay attention to the NFL all the time, all week, I read about it, I listen about it, I study my picks, and all of this rationale I have about Thursday games, I never pick Thursday games during the year. I just don't do it because they're, 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 there's too much uncertainty surrounding them. They're not part of the normal routine of football, the Sunday to Sunday or even Sunday to Monday routine or even at worst Monday to Sunday. They are this weird situation where it's a shortened week. Bodies aren't even recuperated. Um, you're pretty safe picking the home team because at least they didn't have to travel and it all got thrown up with my Thanksgiving. So I do give thanks for everything. I love Thanksgiving, but man, there's parts of Thanksgiving I don't like. And then I tried to add some juice. I tried to add some intensity, some interest to my Thanksgiving with these picks and they all fell on my face. And now I'm probably not going to win another week. I still do have a bunch of weeks left to get that hundred dollars. I'm not going to win the league, but I do look forward to that $100. And, uh, It wasn't to be had, 
on this Thanksgiving. Every single pick I lost. And I'm sure I'm not like a lot of, I mean, I'm sure I'm like a lot of other people who made these picks, but man, wow. The Dallas drubbing is just a shock. At least Detroit made it a game where it was 27, 23, I think in the fourth. I mean, that, that at least had it where it was like, okay, Detroit, you know, they have a touchdown when they're down 27, 23. And all of a sudden it's like 32. They they were in the running. Dallas was just not in the running. And as a Giants fan, at least I'm happy to see Dallas having hard times. But on the one time I picked them with my top pick, I'm not looking for them to lose. I need them to win that one. Well, that's where I am, folks. Thanks so much. Happy Black Friday. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, happy Christmas season. Happy Hanukkah season. Happy, happy everything. It's a great time of year. It's a great time for sports. I was really in to the Wednesday night basketball games. There were like 14 games on the slate. It was like, that was my Thanksgiving there, all that basketball. I just wish basketball on Thanksgiving. I couldn't believe there wasn't one game. But uh, great time of year. I wish you, your families, all the best. And let's close out the year together on a high. Let's not do what I did with my Thanksgiving picks. Let's pick winners going here on out. Let's enjoy our bonus seasons. Let's enjoy our end of years. Let's enjoy our families. Let's enjoy our Christmas parties. It's a great time of year to feel good about each other to look towards a new year to make our resolutions without having to pay them off until the year turns over and uh, let's make it a great one thank you to everyone 